Well, hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Tracy Malik with DecisionWise. Uh, today, I'm very, very pleased to have Dr. Jerry Eldridge Marshall with us here today. And the topic is to discuss mental health in today's organization. Um, and it was, as we were trying to decide on the title for this, one of the things that was very critical is that we addressed what our responsibility is regarding COVID-19 and the workplace well-being. So today we're going to talk about mental health in today's organization, but we'll also talk very, very specifically about what the impact is, particularly as we deal with the current COVID-19 crisis and our responsibility for mental health. Again, I'm very, very pleased to have Dr. Jerry Aldridge Marshall here with me today. We're going to be addressing a few things and I'll introduce Jerry here in just a moment. But the first thing we want to address is the question, what is the impact of stress on the workplace today? So we'll talk about it in general in terms of what stress is, what well-being is. Then we'll also talk about what the responsibility is of an organization when it comes to mental health and well-being. Um, does an organization actually have a responsibility? And if so, what is that responsibility? Next, how has the COVID-19 situation affected individual and organizational well-being? And then finally, what can and should the organization do about it, especially in today's environment? So again, with me, I have Dr. Jerry Aldridge Marshall. Um, Jerry is a, first of all, I'll uh, confess something here. Jerry is a good friend and I've known Jerry for probably a decade now. And I very much appreciated both her knowledge and what she brings to decision wise, but also her knowledge in general in terms of, of well-being. She understands individuals and organizations very well. Uh, Dr. Marshall is a licensed clinical psychologist and um, uh, works with both decision wise and her own private practice. So we're going to talk about some of the experience that she's seen in organizations, as well as dealing with the individual clients that she works with on a, on a daily basis. Jerry, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. You're surviving. You're going through this okay. I am. I am doing well. I have the best of both worlds. I work at home and I also still go to work at an office. So, Well, I want to talk a little bit about that. Some of the differences that maybe you're seeing today versus what you've seen in the past. And uh, we'll, we'll focus on both the individual and the organization as we, we address this. You good to go? Ready to do this? I am. All right. Excellent. So the first piece that we want to address today and the first question that I have for you is, what is the impact of stress in the workplace today? So I want to talk just a little bit about what stress is, first of all, talk about stress in general, but then also stress that we're experiencing in the workplace today. And I just I just noted a few bullet points here. Um, Jerry, we have the definition of stress here. Uh, stress is a physical, mental, or emotional strain or tension. Uh, what would you like to add to that definition? What are you seeing that uh, you'd like to, to throw in there that maybe we should understand about stress? Well, I think one of the things that sneaks up on us is that it accumulates. And so we acclimate to the level of stress we're at. And when it gets up a notch or two, we acclimate to that. So often we're under a lot more stress than we're aware of because it accumulates and we don't de-stress. We don't take it back down to a baseline. We just keep adding it, adding it, adding it until it spills over somewhere. So it kind of sneaks up on us. So what do you think about that first bullet point, stress affects everyone? Is that accurate? Yes. And some are more aware than others, but it does uh, affect everyone. Okay. So one of the things that we want to address today is the fact that stress does affect everyone. So, and understand that that's actually part of what we deal with every day. We want to also address the concept that not all stress is bad. Um, some stress can actually be very beneficial. I know that in some situations, um, it, stress actually causes action to take place. We want to address that and we want to talk the difference between that type of stress and the type of stress that we're particularly dealing with with COVID-19 right now. And the idea that we can't control um, all of the situations that impact us externally, but at the same time, we often control that reaction to stress. And one of the things we'll be asking you about today is how do we control that both as an individual and an organization and what our responsibility is to help us uh, managing those levels of stress. The first thing I want to address though, before we, we really get into the concept of stress is this idea that there is some stress that may be actually beneficial. And that's not necessarily what we're going to be addressing today. The, we have to understand the concept of distress versus eustress. In our book, The uh, Engagement Magic, Five Keys for Engaging People, Leaders, and Organizations, one of the things we talk about is there is a level of stress that's actually quite appropriate. Uh, for example, as an athlete um, ste steps on the line and she's about to, to uh, start that race, uh, that's, that type of use stress, that beneficial stress that that individual gets just for a short period of time actually causes that individual to do something or react in a certain way. Uh, 
This happens in organizations as well. That type of uh, use stress, which is different than distress, allows us to, to make something happen and it impels us or causes us to take action. Uh, one of the things that we note in this is that when we look at the amount of impact we have and the amount of effort that we have, there seems to be a type of matrix. And we also address this in the book when we talk about growth. The idea that if there's not much effort and not much impact, so we're talking about the bottom left-hand quadrant, when the task requires that, we become very bored. When the task um, doesn't require a lot of effort and has a high level of impact, meaning that we just kind of do this all the time, it becomes a routine, we, we're on autopilot. There's that element also where we can truly engage, where the amount of effort that we put in also drives a certain amount of impact or receive results from that. And that's when we actually engage in what we do. What we'll be talking about today is more along the lines of we put in a high degree of effort and we feel like we're not receiving a lot of impact or a lot of results from that. So we'll talk a little bit about burnout today when we talk about uh, employee well-being. But let's really get into the concept of stress and, and what this is. Jerry, would you mind just um, talking a little bit about this and what really happens um, both physiologically and psychologically when stress hits us? Yes, um, actually your side describes it very well, but um, when we have too much going on, um, our chemical levels do change and it does affect um, often all of our organs, but again, we're not paying attention to it. And so until something breaks down over long-term periods of stress, sometimes we don't realize it's having that impact. Um, and I, I guess, you know, when I'm coaching our decision-wise guys and I can hear someone heading to burnout, I'll start asking them about physical symptoms. And often we don't recognize it until we're in trouble physically because we acclimate to it again. It, it's breaking us down, but we don't realize it. In extreme stress, also, our frontal lobe stops working. We can't think anymore. Um, had a fellow come in this week, a vice president of a very successful company, um, isolated at home, um, and having been through a trauma, he described his brain not working. I can't think anymore. I can't sleep. I'm up all night. Um, when I'm trying to work, I can't engage my brain. It doesn't work anymore. Those are extreme cases. Um, but often that sneaks up on us. We have accumulated that level before we recognize it. And then we have something go wrong physically or our brain shuts down. Then we're in trouble. Well, let's look at the, the dichotomy of polarity here. This is a time of stress right now. Uh, people are going through yet. This is a time when critical decisions are being made. Yes. And what this often means is maybe those critical decisions aren't as appropriate or as effective as they, they should have been in a time when it's needed most. Yes. And you look at, you know, some of the, I guess, figures that we're seeing on TV that are just nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. You can see the fatigue on their faces and you can see that you can see in their eyes, you know, that they've had enough. But um, yeah, they're making important decisions. Now, this is just not always at the level of the president of the United States or, or his cabinet or the CEO of an organization and her direct reports. This is at all levels of the organization, this impacts. The, these critical decisions may not be necessarily life decisions as some of these individuals are making, but these are decisions that they're making about, about products, about people, about uh, their own lifestyle, things along these lines. So let's talk yeah. a little bit about the, the next question. What is the responsibility of the organization when it comes to mental health and, and well-being? So Dr. Marshall, let me ask you first of all a question. Does an organization is it the organization's responsibility to monitor or to, or to uh, address the mental health and well-being of, a, of an individual and their employees? You know, Tracy, a couple of things come to mind. I saw two people yesterday in my private practice, both talking about the stress in their workplace. One of them manages uh, properties and people can't pay rent right now because they've been laid off their jobs. So she's dealing with people that are angry, that are stressed, that are fearful, they're yelling at her, um, they're sending her nasty emails. I mean, she's on the front line of some really stressful, nasty, you know, interactions with clients. But she said at the end of the day, I love my job. I love the company I work for, although I don't agree with what they're doing. So they're demanding rent, even if people don't have their jobs. She said, I don't agree with that, but I love the company I work for. And then this was the bottom line for me. 
she said, my supervisor has my back. So she's telling me about this crazy stress she's dealing with, but telling me that she loves her job. She loves the company she works for, even though she disagrees with what they're doing. And her supervisor has her back. And as she said that, I could see her body relax. Like that was key for her, how her supervisor was interacting with her. Other client came in and said, I almost quit my job this week. And as he described what was going on, again, very stressful job. He's on the front line with clients who are not doing well. And he said, in the middle of my shift, I called my supervisor and said I was going to quit. Mm -hmm. And when we explored that a little more, he said the administration, and he shook his head, the administration, they make it worse. They make it harder. I don't have their support. They don't listen. I think I'm going to quit my job. So for me, the organization was making all the difference with these two individuals, with how they were able to manage their own jobs and their own emotions under heightened stress. And all of it's COVID related, things are amped up everywhere. But you know, what's the responsibility of the organization? Well, for the girl that loves the company she works for and feels like her supervisor has her back, they're gonna have a loyal employee that's doing as well as you would expect in this situation. The other company that the fellow feels disconnected from his supervisor and from his administration is about to quit. So this company is looking at turnover. Um, and that is one of the things he said, we have a lot of turnover in our organization. So to me, it seemed directly related to how well the organization was supporting these individuals as they were doing their jobs. Okay. So when it comes to an organization having responsibility, one of the arguments is often, well, it's just what we need to do. Let's talk first about, about um, what well-being is, and then we'll talk about an organization's responsibility for well-being. Um, with the concept of well-being, there really isn't a consensus around what well-being actually is. It could be a bunch of different things and could mean different things to different individuals. But there are a few things that we do understand when it comes to well-being. The first one is that well-being integrates mental health, so the mind, and also the physical health, the body. You talked a little bit about what you're seeing in some of the faces. I've noticed this as I coach individuals as well, particularly those who are tasked with making very, very difficult decisions right now. So leaders of organizations who are wondering, do we, do we uh, vote furloughs or layoffs? Can we reduce whatever that is? They have very difficult conversations or decisions they need to make. And it, it's taking its toll on their physical health. But we're also seeing this with all levels of the organization. Next, well-being is a valid population outcome measure beyond morbidity, mortality, and economic status that tells us how people perceive their life is going from their own perspective. This goes with the next point as well, the concept that we are actually measuring overall well-being now as part of how is this person doing. Um, we're starting to take well-being measures in terms of what is the quality of life beyond just morbidity, mortality, and economic status, this is actually a measure. So um, the reason I put this slide in here is to understand that when we're talking about well-being and an organization's responsibility for this, there is a lot that goes into this concept. And it used to be that we could say uh, an organization's responsibility, yes, an organization should take responsibility for it because it's just the right thing to do. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Marshall, you want to comment on it's the right thing to do, and then we'll talk about uh, the economic piece of this in just a moment. Right. So I guess my mind is going to, but if you don't pay attention to this, you know, your employees are going to turn over. They're not going to be productive. They're not going to be engaged because there's certain conditions that have to be there for people to be um, optimally um, functioning. So it's the right thing to do for your employees. It's also the right thing to do for the company. You're right. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a moral argument saying we should morally take care of our employees and watch out for the well-being. Yeah, that's a piece of it. But as you just mentioned, uh, regardless of, of what our belief is, whether that's the right thing, the moral thing to do, we're, we're receiving the consequences of whatever that, that experience is. Yes. So there are some very real consequences to the organization. So first, first is performance, including physical ability to actually do things. Next is the attitude and behaviors, the willingness to contribute to the organization. So these are the, the consequences of, of mental health and also well-being in an organization, whether they exist or don't exist, but general disengagement. 
Um, our organization focuses on understanding are people engaged? Are they willing to dedicate their minds, their spirits, their hearts, their hands to what they're doing and to give that discretionary effort? In times of stress and well being, um, there's a general uh, disengagement in what they do. They're, they're in survival mode. Uh, relationships, teamwork, and communication. Uh, Jerry, would you mind talking about what, what happens to relationships and teamwork and communication in, in uh, times of crisis or stress like this? Well, a lot of times people shut down and become emotionally isolated, even if they're physically at work. And so they're not, um, they're not present. And once they shut down and stop, um, I guess, interacting or engaging, uh, it, they just become not, not functional not um, not able to perform. So you have the physical piece, which is the absenteeism, but you also have those who are, are mentally um, not at work. That's right. Psychologically absent uh, from their workplace. They might get up and walk around or sit at their computer and look like they're doing something, but their minds are not engaged with their job. They're shut down. Right which also results in decreased innovation and creativity. So when somebody is under stress or their well-being is not being um, taken care of, the innovation and creativity virtually stops. We don't have the ability, our brains don't have the ability to process that at that point in time, which may result in sabotage. We, we talk about two different types of sabotage. One is active sabotage, the other is passive. Active is when I intentionally try to do something negative or harm the organization or others around me. Passive sabotage is when I simply don't care, and so I let things go through. Defective um, widgets on the on the assembly line, or not caring about what's going on. That's passive sabotage, and that results in quality and defect problems. Um, also, the ability to resolve a client's problems. One of the things that I'm I'm understanding right now is as I I typically travel quite a bit, and obviously travel is not happening. And as I try to call and uh, resolve some of these travel issues and cancel some some hotels and some things along these lines. I see two different areas. I, I see one group that's very, very responsive and saying, yes, we'll do what we need to to take care of you, even though we're experiencing difficulties. And the other that is completely un um, unresponsive. They have no desire to resolve that problem. So I'm seeing two different um, areas there. Legal concerns, obviously, when we run into um, stress and um, negative physical environments, we have legal concerns. And then finally, the customer experience. We, we refer to the, um, what we call the law of congruent experience. And that concept is when I have an amazing employee experience, that equals a great customer experience as well. So one of the things that we're seeing right now is that the customer experience uh, is directly reflective of that experience that I'm having as an as a employee in that organization. And that's just being compounded right now by the COVID-19 virus, that experience that I'm having. Um, has direct result in what that customer experience is. And this is what we refer to as emotional contagion. So basically a customer argues with me, I argue back, customer leaves in a huff, frustration carries to the next customer, and we come in this continual loop. But emotional contagion doesn't just affect the, the customer experience or the employee experience. Um, basically our emotions are contagious. So what's happening right now as far as what you see in terms of emotional contagion, Jerry? Do you, do you see this impacting people and organizations? Oh, yes. So, you know, I think right now just watching the news creates a contagion, right? Um, I'm personally not one that has anxiety, but I can only handle so much of the news and I have to turn it off because of the, again, the, the panic and the fear and the threat that's being broadcast there. And then of course, how that trickles down into the workplace. And what I'm seeing with people is either they're thriving because they're being proactive in their lives or they're shutting down and going into a very fearful, um, frozen kind of place. And of course that spreads to whoever they contact, right? Just like the virus, this emotional contagion spreads as well. So seeing it very much with people. Yeah. It becomes uh, very much a reality that that perception that I have of what's going on spreads and that emotion that I have spreads uh, very clearly, no question. So we started this section with the concept of what is the responsibility an organ or organization has or doesn't organization have responsibility to well-being and uh, to, to address stress and things along these lines. And the answer to me is very clearly, and this is my own personal opinion, uh, first of all, we have a moral responsibility to do this, number one. 
but there's real there's a real result beyond the moral responsibility regardless of of what happens we as an organization are going to deal with the effects of whatever that is um and so some of those effects could be whether they're emotional physical financial economic whatever that is here's an interesting statistic that i found on the who on whose website the world health organization five of the ten leading causes of disability in workplace worldwide are mental health problems that's an estimated 200 million work days in the u.s alone each year uh, very very expensive so whether we believe it's a moral or ethical responsibility we have for the mental well-being of our of our organization, our employees, we're going to, to deal with the consequences either way. All right, Dr. Marshall, you ready for the next question? I am. All right, here we go. How has the COVID-19 situation affected individual and organizational well-being? So tell us a little bit more about that. You addressed part of it. What are you seeing? Well, I'm seeing that the level of stress in general is up a notch or two or 10, depending. Um, on where you are and what you're doing. And what, again, what I've seen is people that are going to work, like they are, they're part of essential businesses. So they have a little more normalcy in their work. Um, they're still experiencing the stress, but I think that because they're, they're outside their homes, they're still going to work, they have a rhythm. Um, they're a little bit more active and proactive and they're less fearful. I'm seeing people that are isolated, working from home, not leaving their homes, not being proactive, not even going outside to breathe the fresh air, not getting in their cars, going for a ride, but just really hunkered down at home and very social, socially isolated, being much more fearful. And the stress is affecting them more, I think, because of the... I guess the inactivity or the just, you know, hunkered down waiting to get hit by the virus rather than engaging in life to the extent that they can with the restrictions that they have. And we're social creatures. We're, we're, our brains are organized to be interacting with each other. And so when we don't, um, we go into a threat mode and we go into a mode of feeling like the world is not safe because we don't have our normal connections because we're wired to be connected. So the more disconnected we are, the more threat we will naturally feel from being isolated. I think that those are important points. You mentioned a few things. One is the isolation or that desire, that natural need we have for connection to something, whether it's people, to an organization, whatever that is. And I wanna make sure we address that a little bit later on. You also mentioned the concept of routine, the idea that we, we have this sense of, of normalcy or normality that that we, we crave almost, there's a routine that, we, that we've broken and that causes a lot of issues. Um, I, I wanna get back to that and I wanna make sure we address those pieces. As we do that, I, I also wanna talk about what stress does during, uh, um, for COVID-19, for example. This is from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control. And um, a couple of points that they show on their, on their websites regarding managing stress, I think was very, very interesting during this time. First, um, stress during the infectious disease outbreak includes these things. Fear and worry about one's own health and the health of your loved ones. Next, changes in sleep or eating patterns. Third, difficulty sleeping. Worsening of chronic health problems. Increased use of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. And cognitive impairment, difficulty concentrating, and inability to make important decisions. I want to address that last one here for just a minute, but uh, Dr. Marshall, we could have you talk a little bit about some of those others that you've seen both in coaching individuals in the workplace and also um, the individual clients you see on a day to day basis. One of the things that I've noticed is that as I'm uh, coaching individuals, <clears throat> the coaching is a lot less geared towards, okay, how do I become an effective leader in the organization? And a lot more geared towards, uh, I have these decisions I need to make and I'm having difficulty making these decisions. Can I just talk through this with somebody? Because right now I'm, I'm feeling like my brain's in, bit of, uh, in a bit of a fog. It's been very interesting that the shift in that coaching that I've seen just over the last couple of weeks in what they're really looking for. Uh, Jerry, would you mind commenting on maybe that and some of these other things that you've seen? What, what, what are you noticing? Sure. So starting with changing in eating habits and sleeping habits, if you're not getting enough sleep, your brain starts to um, 
disintegrate. So sleep is so foundational for functioning physically and cognitively with those making decisions, et cetera. Um, so I've been talking a lot about sleep hygiene with people because they're having trouble sleeping. Um, exercise, people are like sequestered. They're not getting their normal amount of um, exercise. That's also so important with regulating stress and with our body's reset button. If we're physically active, our body resets itself more easily than if we're sedentary. Um, also, we start eating sometimes those comfort foods that uh, maybe high sugar, high carbs that we get a crash off of. When they go out of our system, then we eat more because we're crashing off of it. So we get into these cycles of eating that don't facilitate stability. They, you know, they, um, they create ups and downs in our energy and in our moods. And then, of course, under stress, everything that's kind of weak in our body gets weaker. And all of that compounds to your brain stops functioning the way that it normally functions. And so, and the talking out loud to someone, that processing as if you're talking to someone is different than letting it roll around in your head. Um, that's true of my therapy patients too. They can think and think and think and think and think and while it's rolling in their head, that's all it does is roll in their head. But when they say it out loud to someone else, as if someone's receiving what they're saying, for some reason it releases it and it processes it differently in the brain. So it becomes more clear and it makes more sense. So again, the fact that we're social creatures and we're meant to talk to each other, not just roll things in our own head, um, we're wired that way. It's important that we do that. To get that concentration back, um, the ability to think back, it really goes back to basic self-care. You need to get sleep. You need to get exercise. You need to be careful what you're eating so that you're not creating brain fog by eating too much sugar or crashing off caffeine, that kind of thing. Makes a lot of sense. So I, I want to do a little quiz here. Are you okay with this? Sure. All right. So this is according to the former U.S. Surgeon General. And you see my sources down there at the bottom. What's the leading, leading cause of mortality in the U.S. today? So if anyone is watching this, viewing this, just take a look for just a second and, and see if you can understand or, or guess which one of those might be. So it ranges from high blood, blood pressure and A down to H, automobile accidents. I'll give you just a second to, to take a look at that and look it over. And then I want to reveal the Surgeon General's response on what that is. Um, Jerry, this actually surprised me, but then when I thought about it, um, it didn't surprise me. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The answer is D, social isolation. So was this any surprise to you? You know, I, I had to think about it, but when you think about what that, what that does to someone, right. it, affects, it affects your blood pressure. <laughs> you know, it, it, it makes you in an imbalanced state where cancer is more likely, you know, to happen in your body. It, it affects all of that. So it's kind of a, I guess, a foundational element to all of those other things that are on there. It is. It's the concept that this is actually the primary factor. There are others are secondary factors or results often of what that is. So social isolation could result in um, alcohol use or drug use. It could result in obesity. Um, I'll tell you, in my case, like you mentioned in the last slide, uh, being socially isolated right now, um, my eating habits have completely changed. So there's things along those lines that um, they certainly cause, which in turn results in high blood pressure some things along these lines. So I thought it was very interesting as he mentioned this. This is from his um, concept, Work and Loneliness uh, Epidemic. You know, it's an HBR publication. So one of the things we need to be concerned about with this COVID-19 issue is social isolation and what that actually means. Um, we have to think back for just a minute about what work actually provides us in terms of well-being, psychological well-being. The first one is social contact and identity. Um, first of all, I, I see myself as part of a social group, and part of that is my identity. When people ask me about myself, one of the things I do is I describe that in terms of a social context. So I am a father of four. Um, I am married of, to my wife for 30 years. Uh, I am a CEO of an organization. I am a professor. So these are my identities tied a lot to that social um, context. And also the next piece is there's, it's Work provides a collective effort and purpose. So it's, it's a place where I can go and actually get something done with other people when maybe I can't do this in other places. Work also provides me a time structure. Um, I show up at work at seven in the morning and I leave at whatever time it is or, or eight o'clock at night, but some type of time structure. Um, it's a regular activity. 
And there's some, there's some degree of value, as you mentioned, about that routine that we'll talk about a little bit later. It's physical or mental activity that that causes me to do um, that I may not do if I'm just sitting watching TV or gaming all day long. It also provides me with a sense of self-worth and accomplishment. I feel like I've actually done something and therefore I, I'm adding some value to something in whether I, whether I believe in the meaning and the purpose of the organization or not, at least it provides me with self-worth and, and value. And finally, it allows me to grow rather than stagnate. I go to work and I find new things. And this is one of the reasons why the workplace is so important to that psychological well-being. Jerry, any comments on any of those concepts or any you'd like to add? Well, when we don't have these elements in our life, um, we don't have the type of eustress that makes us functional. So right now, while people are home and isolated and they don't have that regular rhythm, if you don't have enough stress in your life or enough structure in your life, you can't motivate yourself to do anything. Um, I'm working with a fellow who just retired and he went from being very active, very functional, very structured, um, very time-oriented, very productive before work and after work and all of that, to retirement where he has no structure anymore. And he said, I can't get myself to do anything. I can't get myself to engage in my hobbies. I can't get myself to get up. I can't get myself to get out of my jammies. And it's that lack of structure, that lack of, um, you have to have enough structure and stress in your life that it prompts you to go. And so when it's taken away from you or you've removed it from your life to the extent that you don't have that prompt to go, you become very dysfunctional. So a lot of people right now that are home are experiencing that almost paralysis from not having enough stress or enough structure to be motivated. And typically when you have a job, it's coming from externally. You got to be to work on time. There's things you need to do. There's deadlines. There's things that keep you going. And when all of that pressure is now on you to do it internally rather than external, you know, you need to be to class or you need to be here. Now it's all up to you to do all that structuring. It's a little tougher to have that motivation come from internally because there aren't the external pressures. And, and then to just structure because the lack of structure turns us into slugs. So mm -hmm. a lot of people are experiencing I'm not enough use stress to be functional in their lives because all of these elements now are missing or are depending on us to create them rather than an external structure to create them. So where those prompts were there externally before, those prompts now need to come or those triggers need to come internally. Uh, yes. That workplace environment doesn't exist. Interesting. Let's talk a little bit about the concept of loneliness. When we talk about loneliness, often we, we think about the 90 year old that's, that's in her home, the, the widow that, that is just nobody comes to visit. And that's part of it. Uh, we did a, quite a bit of work with um, the elderly in terms of uh, surveying and, and doing some polling and understanding what they were experiencing. We did this in our organization. And it was very interesting as those reports would come back, what would happen, they were mailed to these individuals because many of them didn't have internet access. And um, it was, I remember talking to one of our employees and she was crying as she received the survey in the mail from one of those, these people, uh, these individuals. And uh, just reading through some of these comments about how destructive that was, just feeling that loneliness that they had. But it was also very interesting as I saw some of these surveys come in and this was the employee that I saw her crying as she was reading the response, but included in that response um, often were things such as medical bills or things along these lines that either they had put in there because of dementia, thinking they put the, the right survey in, or because they just wanted to give an indicator of, hey, look, this is kind of what I'm experiencing in my life. And nobody was there to talk to. It's often what we think of when we think of loneliness. But um, loneliness also applies in social isolation contexts as well. It's not just the 90-year-old sitting in her home. It's also what we're experiencing right now. And, and Jerry, I'm going to ask you to comment on that in just a second here, but this is also from the U.S. Surgeon General. Loneliness and weak social connections are associated with a reduction in lifespan, similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and even greater than that associated with obesity. Jerry, how can we experience loneliness, first of all, when there's so many people around us, but how in particular now with COVID-19? Well, I think um, people experience it differently too. So I know when I'm talking to people who are feeling lonely or isolated and I ask them 
You know, are you Skyping? Are you talking on the phone? Are you reaching out? For some people that whets that appetite or that need for connection and with others, they need to be physically with someone else. And I don't know if that's breaks down in introversion or extroversion or what element that is that some people need physical contact. They need to be with someone else versus the person that can talk on the phone or Skype or join a meeting at work and, and feel that need for connection that way. Um, but you can be lonely around people too um, if you're around people that you don't connect with. So that's probably the loneliest people that I deal with are ones that are around people but not connecting with them. So they're isolated while they're with people. One of the things that we talk about in, in the book, Engagement Magic, we, MAGIC stands for Meaning, Autonomy, Growth, Impact, and Connection. MAGIC. It's an acronym. And the idea here is that we engage in life, we engage in work, we engage in relationships when, when they have meaning. There's a reason, a purpose behind it. We have autonomy. We can do things on our own or use our best skills and do our best of our abilities. We're growing. The G piece. I as impact. I feel results of my effort. But the C, as we do all kinds of psychometric assessments and surveys and assessments along those lines, we find that the C, the connection piece, is actually the greatest source of engagement. When I feel a connection or a sense of belonging to something beyond myself, that could be people, an organization, a meaning, a task, I feel connected to something, um, I'm much more likely to engage in life and engage in the things I do. And one of the concerns with COVID-19 right now is that connection is being partially taken away. Yes. So something to be aware of. And, and Jerry, I'll ask you to just comment on this one before we move on to the next section. Current social distancing guidelines guideline is, is essential, but keep in mind the potential impact on well-being. Um, you're seeing this. You see this both in coaching and in your private practice. Is that correct? Yes. And, you know, some people, again, are more conscious of their needs and others are not. So some people will suffer more then they probably need to before they become proactive to sort out what what do i need and if you're an extrovert and you need people then it's good to figure out how to do that you know being wise right now and of course we're seeing in that 20 to 30 group that think they're invisible are getting COVID at a higher rate right so they're not being maybe as um, cautious as they should be and yet there's others that are being over cautious and not minding their uh, I guess, emotional need for connection. And there's got to be a balance between being smart right now where we know how this virus spreads, but also being mindful of what our needs are emotionally to get those needs met while we're being careful and cautious. I am a very, very strong introvert, um, testing off the scale on every assessment that, that exists there. Um, does it mean I don't like people? No, absolutely quite the opposite. I love people, but I process things as an introvert. And one of the things that I'm looking at myself right now is that even though I am um, isolated and I'm distanced and I don't have that day-to-day -day interaction, one of the things I'm noticing, and we see, Jerry, you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, the memes that we see right now is about introverts, how we've been practicing for this our entire lives. And what I'm seeing is just after a small bit of that, I'm looking for every opportunity that I can to have to check in with people to do one-on-ones, to, to even uh, use Skype or Teams or Zoom or whatever we can to be able to talk to individuals, to find out what's going on. I crave that and I found that I'm actually missing that. And I think somebody with even stronger desires for that social connection would feel that e even more than I would. Yes. So let's get to some of the meat here. What can and should an organization do about this? All right, so we've talked about the impact of stress and uh, the responsibility of an organization for well-being. We talked about some of the results that this causes. We talked a little bit about um, what, what we, our responsibilities are to be able to address that, but now how do we as an organization address that? And, and Dr. Marshall, as we're talking, we'll talk specifically about the organization, but if you can bring in some of the concepts about we as individuals, what we can do. So it's important to understand that we're facing unprecedented times. So this is something we've never really dealt with before as an organization. Um, the, we, we rely so much on, on, on interconnection and intraconnection. 
and we're experiencing something different. So this is different than what we would have talked about, say, 10 years ago, and we need to understand that. So what can you do as an organization? I want to make sure we don't frame this in the context of, well, you can continue offering benefits. You can. I want to take this out of that part. I want to talk about specifically the well-being. And I'll address the first one, which is protect your employees physically. One of the things that we're seeing right now is obviously we have a, a, a legal and a, and a social responsibility to protect our employees. But let's talk a little bit about employees who don't feel like they're being um, physically protected. Jerry, any comments on that? We're seeing that in the medical field right now. That the, you know, a lot of people saying, hey, I as a doctor, I as a nurse, I as a medical professional, and not being protected, and that impacts their, their well-being. Yes, I'm seeing that too with people um, that are working and feeling like their employer is not taking things seriously as far as protecting them. They become very distrustful, so they don't trust their employer anymore, and they become more fearful, and they feel the need to take care of themselves probably more so than they would if their employer were being mindful or expressing concern for them or at least following the CDC guidelines, you know, that we've been given about how to stay safe, but definitely increases people's stress and creates a, a sense of not trusting the employer when they're not being taken care of that way. Aren't we seeing some of this in government right now? Not, not just U.S. government, but everywhere, state government, uh, international government, things like this, that when they're not feeling like somebody is watching out for them, uh, they lose trust. Like you say, that distrust exists. Yes. Let's talk about number two, be mindful of what employees are experiencing. The first thing is how do I become mindful? Number one is, is within yourself, understand that, hey, as I'm mentioning this, this is how somebody may be reacting to this or what they may be seeing. But one of the ways we do this is through one-on-ones. And one of the concerns that I have in a lot of organizations and the people that I'm coaching, I'm saying, well, how are your one-on-ones going? And they say, well, I can't have one-on-ones anymore. And I say, you can't? You can't pick up a telephone, you can't Skype, you can't um, message, you can't text. And it, it's almost as if it's a foreign context, a uh, foreign concept to them. The concept of, first of all, understanding one-on-one um, -on -one what they're dealing with, but also just understand that as I send a message, that that message may be received under a different lens because they're looking at it a different way. I think too, that being mindful starts with you to be mindful of yourself. What are you going through? How stable are you? How well are you taking care of yourself um, so that you're able to be mindful of someone else and aware of them? So if you're in a partial shutdown yourself or the stress is overwhelming you too and you're not sleeping and you're not thinking, um, it's tougher to check in with other people uh, because you're reeling with your own lack of stability. So some of the mindful is be mindful of yourself and take care of yourself so that you have a, I guess, a better ability to be mindful of someone else to take care of them. Excellent. Number three, connect socially. Uh, interesting in our own organization, um, one of our uh, team members have taken upon herself to organize a photo scavenger hunt. And I absolutely love it. Um, and what this basically is, is we're using um, communication meeting, we use Teams. And what's happening is she'll post at the first of the week, here are, all the, here are all the scavenger hunt items that you need to come up with. And people are posting themselves with a picture of pickles or, or a view of their back deck or whatever that may be. And the idea here is, is to have a little bit of fun and humor really goes a long way, but what it does is help people understand that we are still people here. We're not just a bunch of cogs that are off doing their thing and, and connecting people socially. One of the things we do is we have team meetings pretty regularly to maintain that routine. Um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, team meeting where everybody in the organization gets together just to talk and check in. And that social connection can still happen. Um, as you're coaching, Jerry, as you're uh, counseling, what are some of the things that you've seen that works in terms of social connection there? You know, I'm asking those kind of questions too. Are you checking in with people? Are you Skyping? Are you still um, checking on grandma and grandpa? Are you you know, just because you can't leave your house doesn't mean you can't connect with people. Um, are you reaching out? Are you talking to people about your fears? Are you sharing your insecurities? Are you sharing your joys? Are you still laughing about something? And are you still sharing that with someone? Um, are you being creative? 
with how you can connect and still be cautious and careful. But again, when you go into shutdown mode, you quit thinking about those things. You don't realize we have resources that we can use to stay connected. Are we using them? Are we using them to the extent we need to use them right now? Do we need to be using them more than we would usually use them? Because we are isolated. So um, I think sometimes we have more resource around us than we're, I guess, intentionally, I like the word intentionally there, that we're intentionally using. Because it doesn't just happen, does it? it you have no. to make it happen. That's one of the big differences here. Social connection before this, when people were all together, just happened. Because the person, we, we call them drive-bys, would just walk by your office and talk to you or, or tap on your shoulder in the cubicle. Or you'd meet that person as you're going to the restroom, as you're heading over there to the rink you found or lunch. Um, but now we have to make that happen. It doesn't just happen. Yes. Next one is provide the direction. I was impressed last week um, by a video that I watched several different times and, and showed it around. CEO of Marriott International um, got up and announced and did a video, very, very personal video at the start, but then also the rest of it was talking about, here are some of the things that we need to do. Here's the direction we're going and made that very clear. Um, it's difficult to understand what direction many organizations are going because they're playing it minute by minute. But the more we can show, here's what we're doing, and here's what the next week looks like, or here's what the next day looks like, or here's what the next six months look like, the more that we can provide that direction, people at least have a target and know that A, someone is watching their backs, that someone is aware of the situation, B, we are moving towards something, and then the last one is I have a purpose in making that happen or getting to that direction. Um, what are you seeing when people lack direction um, right now? And do, do you see that, first of all, or is that just an assumption? No, I think that's so true that um, someone needs to be at the 60,000 foot view forecasting, you know, where we're going and forecasting a future. And even if it's going to change minute by minute, hour by hour, week by week, that forecast, I think, is important uh, for people to feel secure about a future. And sometimes the direction needs to be, this is what we're going to do for today, or this is what we're going to do for this week, and this is what the forecast is. We hear that a little bit in the news, too. You know, we think this is going to peak at this week, and we, you know, think we're going to be coming in for a landing here. Some of those messages, I think, are, um, they help us settle down, because then the world, we think, is more predictable. So we need to be able to predict our world a little bit, and I think those forecasts, you know, are, they help us predict. And even if the forecast is going to change, we feel more comfortable that it's there. So I think the, yeah, the lack of direction, whether it's you're at home by yourself trying to sort your job out or trying to figure out what to do with your kids, or you're trying to forecast, when will I go back to work? Or when will this stabilize? When will I have an income again? Um, anything that puts predictability back in the world, or at least an educated guess, helps us relax. Very good. Number five, communicate to reduce uncertainty. We provided a webinar on this when we got a number of our consultants together last week. And one of the things we were talking about how to communicate during these difficult times, we have uh, to our advantage a number of different communication methods that we can use. But the concept was brought up about um, a vacuum and how na nature abhors a vacuum. We learned this in, in ninth, seventh grade physics or whatever it is, the idea that we fill in information. What's happening right now is many organizations are operating in a vacuum of information. And what happens is when that exists, we fill in that vacuum with misinformation. So our, brain, our brains and our, and our minds naturally want to fill in these voids of communication. And if you don't fill in that void for me, I will fill that in myself. And more likely than not, it will be misinformation or incorrect information. So even though we can't communicate what we'll, where we'll be in 18 months from now, we really can't in many situations. What we can communicate is, here's what I do know. Here's the status for today. Here's what's happening over the next week. And here's what we're doing about it. And I think many people are just uh, suffering from lack of communication right now. Uh, what have you seen individually and in organizations, Jerry? You know, as, you, as I'm listening to you talk, one of the things that comes to my mind is, you're right, when we're filling in information because we don't have it or we're filling it in, our brains have a negativity bias. Mm -hmm. um, our brains are meant to scan for threat and worst case scenario. And so that's where we naturally go. 
if there's not something else there. We will go to worst case scenario in our brain, which of course increase our level of threat because we're wired that way. So to have something that directs us to not going there, that this is what we know, this is what we're doing, um, that direction, you know, whether you're organizing that yourself or whether it's coming from someone else, it keeps your brain from going to that negativity bias where you're filling in the gaps with things that are um, potential threats that may not be rational, they may not be real, but it's preparing you for it. And that's what our brains do. And it's not always helpful. Once in a while it is, but often it just creates more chaos and of course more fear and more stress. So that direction I think is very, very important. Excellent. Next one you've already talked about, the concept of establishing routines and the importance of having routine. This has thrown us completely off of our game. Um, you know, I attended a, a class in neuroscience at MIT this last week, excellent class. And uh, one of the things we were talking about was the importance of routines to our, our mental health and making things happen. And it was interesting that one of the most important things that we can actually do when we, when we feel like we're disconnected and don't have that routine is, is to shower. Okay, now it sounds really strange, shower. But think about it for just a second. As we talk about, um, you know, what, as we're in the shower, it frees up our minds. We are able to think through some things. But more importantly, even than that, is the idea that what happens is that we've, we've done something that is normal for us, that feels good. We can do it. We can get it knocked out. It starts our day. When my kids were, when one of my sons was married, uh, the wedding advice that he received in, in the wedding ceremony was, um, two of you, just make your bed in the morning. Start by making your bed. And the concept was, okay, why is that? What does that have to do with it? It's the idea that we establish a routine that we're doing together that's part of our normal life. It just is part of what we do. And right now we're so taken out of routines that the more we can get back to that routine, to doing what's normal for us that we're good at, that we don't have to think about, um, the more effective we're going to be as we, we go through this. Comments? Yes, that goes back to, again, making life predictable. So when your whole day is unscheduled and your whole day is just up to you, um, it, it's not predictable. And so we automatically start feeling a higher level of uncertainty. So if we're going to get up and we're going to shower and we're going to make our bed and we're going to eat a decent breakfast, you've already started um, creating predictability in your world. So if you can put those markers in there, that this is what we're going to do. It creates, um, again, predictability and it lowers the threat level with what's going on that you can't control because you can control that. We know this with children, that we keep children in a routine so their world is predictable, but we don't think it applies to us, but it really does. We need our worlds predictable too. And so those little teeny things um, keep us being able to feel more, I guess, secure in our day, in our, in our environment, because we can predict what's going to happen next, because we're, you know, we're imposing it, we're creating it. So much of what happens in organizations, I'm thinking of healthcare right now, is, is out of the routine. We, we simply have to break those routines. We can't do that anymore. We talked about the individual level. It's easy to see, you know, take the shower, make the bed, things like that. But on an organizational level, there are routines that we have to take a look at and say, all right, what was part of our routine before that we can still do? I know in our organization, that's our check-ins. We do regular check-ins. Um, there are status update sheets that we just fill in regularly. There are one-on-ones that just continue to happen. So one of the things that we recommend for organizations is understand what those routines were before and ask yourself, A, should, should we still be doing those? If we should, B, how do we make that happen? And C, where we can't make those the same way we could before, is there a way around this? Can we reshape that so the purpose of that routine is still upheld? So establishing routines. Absolutely. Next one, provide impact. Um, I was talking to one of my coworkers that's, uh, I believe on his 12th or 13th marathon, and I said, how in the world do you do that? So first of all, I can't, I can't picture running the 26.2. But beyond that, how do you keep doing this? And he says, well, I, I don't really think about my next 10 marathons. What I think about is really the next step. And what he was describing is the way he gets through a marathon and in his mind is he will find somebody and target that individual way up ahead. So his, his next target is simply to pass the uh, woman running with the T on the back of her T-shirt. The next one is to, to catch up to the guy with the big calves. 
So he establishes very, very clear milestones that he makes so he can see the impact that he's making. And that's how he arrives at the end goal. One of the things to understand here is that if we, we provide as our direction, hey, we're just gonna survive this thing, rather than saying, no, here are some, some steps that you can win at, then uh, we're not providing that impact. And impact's one of those magic components, meaning autonomy, growth, impact, and connection that cause us to engage in what we do. Uh, Jerry, I'm imagining, and this is just me imagining because I'm seeing this in my coaching, that a lot of people are feeling like they're just kind of spinning their wheels right now. Uh, do you yes. see that personally? So if you're a checklist person, you definitely want to have a checklist every day so that you feel like you are getting something done. You are accomplishing. And if you're not a checklist person, that's not a bad thing to start right now, that you're actually writing down, oh, I did do this. I did do this. I did do this. Because, yeah, a lot of times we do feel like we're just spinning our wheels and we're kind of floating through the day, but we don't know if we're getting anything done. And we inherently need to feel that sense of accomplishment so you know to write down and this is what i want to do today and then check it off again for checklist people this is a must do but if you're not a checklist person it kind of helps maybe organize that in your brain and to reinforce to yourself yeah i did do that i did do that i did do that so that at the end of the day you know that you've made an impact you know that you've accomplished something instead of just feeling like you're free floating in the air and not connected or moving anywhere. And I love the idea on this way anyway, that uh, if it's not on the checklist and I've done it, I will write it on the checklist just so I yes. can work from us. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. organizations can schedule impact. You can break things down and say, okay, yeah, we can't predict the next six months, but what we can do is we can knock out this project. We can develop this new tool. We can do this. And so that they do receive that impact in their lives. I'm going to ask you to address the next one. Take advantage of mental health tools. Are there some tools right now that they can use in an organization that come on top of your mind by any chance? Um, you know, the internet is full of information and some of it's so basic that we don't pay attention to it. I love that you have a guy riding a bicycle on this slide because movement is probably the most powerful, inexpensive, um, mental health tool that there is exercise resets resets our brains resets our body really one of the foundational keys to being mentally healthy is to be physically as active as you can be now you don't have to be a super duper marathon runner you don't have to um, do anything spectacular but move because movement will reset your mental health dial um and a lot of the things we've talked about connection, if we're not appropriately connected for what we need, we're not going to be mentally healthy. Um, our thoughts are so crucial, you know, to be monitoring our thoughts because we do have a negativity bias and we will automatically go to negative thoughts when we're not feeling well. We need to be on um, point with um, examining those and not staying in those. But again, those are such simple things that sometimes we don't think they're effective, but those basic tools uh, make huge differences in how we feel. And again, those are available, um, well, and again, you're talking about an organization and we're working remotely. There's still ways to promote that and check in with that. Um, I'm thinking when we all did work together, you know, people would do walk breaks and those kinds of things. And you can still do that um, remotely. You know, that you check in with people about, are you, are you getting out of the house? Are you walking around the block? Are you still getting your steps in? Mm -hmm. And to do those step challenges, those kinds of things um, are still possible. And they're basic and they're simple, but they're very effective. You know, when I uh, thought about this bullet point, there are all kinds of mental health tools that are available. And what happens is in times of crisis, we think we're on, we're on our own and we're not. There are these things to be aware of. Um, make sure as an organization, you're making your employees aware of these as well, both individually and as an organization. The last one, and this is, we won't spend a lot of time on this one, but I think this is just kind of the summary. Show hope, but be real at the same time. Um, there are some stories that need to be told. I was talking about a little bit earlier, the CEO of Marriott International, as he talked about his video, uh, the video that he did, um, he announced some very, very tough moves. He said, here's where we are, here's the reality. So he painted the picture very clearly in their mind. He told the story. 
He also told the story of his own personal challenge that he was dealing with just briefly. He was real and he came across as a real person, even though the message was, was difficult, extremely difficult. At the same time, one of our responsibilities as an organization is to show hope, but still be realistic. If we're painting a picture and that picture doesn't come to fruition, um, and that picture is, is rosy and things along these lines, then we lose that trust in, in the individual of the organization. So tell those stories that need to be told, show hope, but be a real person, be a real organization, not just a machine. Comments on that one, Jerry, as we end here? Yes, you know, we have a pretty good radar for authenticity. So when someone's just talking to talk, we all know that. And someone's talking from a real place and they're being authentic, we get that too. And that authenticity, I can say that authenticity is probably more important than the words that are said because we will connect to that and we'll feel safe because someone is being real, um, regardless of what they're saying. Even if they're giving us the hard forecast, the fact that they're with us and real with us will help us feel safe and comfortable. Is there something to be said in times like this to vulnerability? This is a true question. Vulnerability, meaning I get up and say, hey, look, I'm scared too a little bit. I don't know what's going on. Or does the leader need to stand up and say, here's where we're going and I'm in full control. What are people looking for in an organization right now in a leader? Um, both. So, you know, that vulnerability coming from a leader makes them very relatable. But then when they can go, a leader can go into, you know, from where I sit right now, this is the direction I feel like we need to go and this is the outcome I think it will produce. But starting with that vulnerability, again, creates the connection. I can connect to you because you're scared like me and you're at the 60,000 foot view and this is what you see and where you want to go. And I'm willing to follow you because I've connected with you because you've been vulnerable and I can feel you. That's how leaders get people to follow them. It's like, mm -hmm. I understand that you're in touch. And so if that's what you think, I'll follow you. So I think it starts with that vulnerability and being authentic, but then goes definitely into a leadership mode. Excellent. Dr. Marshall, it's been a pleasure to work with you, um, to talk to you today about mental health in today's organization and about what our responsibility is and how COVID is impacting the organization. I think one of the big things that I'm pulling out of this is the concept that yes, we as an organization do have a responsibility always for well-being and mental health, but more than just that, particularly in today's COVID-19 um, uh, generation or the era that we're facing right now. Jerry, thank you again for your time. Um, best, wish, best wishes to you as you navigate your own uh, challenges with COVID-19 as we all are as well. So thank you for being with us today. We appreciate that very much. You are welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.